Well, we are going into a new study. We have been in uh, the book of Luke. No, no, no. Yeah, the book of Luke for quite a while. But we got through it. Amen. And we are better because of it. Amen. And uh, stronger because of it. Uh, have more knowledge of the word because of it. And uh, so tonight we are going to begin our new study in the book of Revelations. Amen. The book of Revelations. And uh, there is a special blessing uh, pronounced on those that read this book. Amen. Amen. So know that there's a special blessing coming on you as you uh, commit yourself to this study. And I hope you won't just wait until you get here. Uh, to get into the book of Revelations, but that you would read it uh, throughout the week and come um, uh, with a new revelation or just insight and understanding that God has given you. Like he did, John, when he was on that island of Patmos. You know, it was uh, John still in the way, being alone in the presence of God. And John was, uh, he was a prisoner that didn't do anything wrong. Uh, but he was in prison for 18 months. And out of that came the book of Revelations. Amen. So God can take what the enemy means for evil and work it out for the people of God's good. Amen. And he promises that in his word. But bow your heads with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you on tonight. Thank you for the testimonies, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for how you're working in your people's lives. I thank you, Lord, for your word. It is indeed a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Illuminate tonight, God. Give us insight, understanding, Father God, and, and revelation as we read the book of Revelations. And Lord, I pray... Uh, that you would uh, speak through my mouth tonight. Help me to share what you would have me to share tonight. I know, Lord, I can only grace, I guess, the surface tonight. But Holy Spirit, you have your way. You have your way. And when we come out of this book, I pray that we will be at another place of encouragement, another place of strength, another place of endurance and, and standing and doing what God has called us to do. Father, because your word of prophecy is true. Yes. And you will accomplish those things that you have said you are going to accomplish. And so, Father, we wait with patience. Lord, we wait, Father God, with an assurance, Lord, because you cannot lie. So, Lord, have your way as we go through this book, I pray in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. 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 Well, as we get into the book of Revelations, we actually won't get much into um, the actual scripture reading of it tonight because I want to talk a little bit about the circumstances surrounding, uh, uh, surrounding John when he wrote this book, also uh, the circumstances uh, surrounding um, him, what he was going through. Uh, but why don't we open with uh, Revelations 1 through 3. Uh, and it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. I'll give you a minute to get there. I see people still turning. But it reads, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to, the, to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Amen. The time is near. But uh, we're going to look at just a little history, a little um, uh, some things that we need to know to get, um, to get the most out of this uh, particular book. 
Um, we know that uh, John was on the Isle of Patmos. He was exiled to and wrote Revelations. Um, the remarkable account of John's life leading up to his exile to Patmos. So we're going to look at um, just some of those things. Um, and I'm going to kind of go a little quickly. Uh, this is uh, just a, a, a picture that I pulled up of Patmos, uh, the geography, and you can see it was just, um, you probably can't tell much from this, but as we go along, I'll have another picture. You can see a little bit more uh, how um, it was. Um, it, it was not a pretty picture, or it was not a, a great thing, but John found a high point on that mountain and he, um, at that point, had a vision and God spoke to him and he began to write the book of Revelation. Some believed uh, that one of his protégés, one of his, um, uh, the people that he had trained in the things of God, actually one of the, the deacons, um, uh, agreed to go into exile with him. He was not exiled, but he wanted to go with Paul and that he actually hung with John. him, John rather, he actually hung with John and wrote uh, the things that John saw. Now that kind of makes a little sense to me because if he was caught up, you know, in the third heavens at that time, it seems like it would be a little hard for him to write. Um, but I do know that when God is speaking to you in that way, I've had times when I've been caught up in the spirit and I hear the Lord and I know he's speaking to me. There is something about it that you do, you're able to remember what he's saying to you and write those things down. So he could have gone both ways. John could have wrote with his own hands or he could have had uh, someone with him. The small island of Patmos is about 7.5 miles long, north to south, and at its width is six miles from east to west. It's a small island. In the year of 95 AD, a sailing vessel filled with prisoners slowly glided into the port on the Isle of Patmos. On board was the elderly apostle, um, John. Designated as a prisoner where many of Rome, Rome, Romans, Rome's worst enemies and criminals were incarcerated, this small desolate island belonged to a group of islands known as the Saporades. Uh, it was located 24 miles off the coastline of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, okay. 60 miles from, it should read, uh, Ephesus. Uh, this is a map. You can kind of see, uh, let me see if I can. Okay, you can kind of see Ephesus is up here. Patmos is here. Okay. And so he was sent from Ephesus, exiled from Ephesus, and as we get into it, you'll find out why, and sent to this island. Okay. Padmas was isolated, desolate, and mostly forsaken, mostly forsaken. What transpired there wasn't visible to the public eye. That was important, um, and you'll find out why. As a result, laws that guarantee the good treatment of prisoners could be and often were ignored. Thus, the Roman government considered Padmas to be an ideal place for especially dangerous criminals. The common criminals versus the, politi versus the political offenders. Now, uh, John was considered a political offender. John was a political prisoner. When the prisoners uh, disembarked from the ship, they were divided into two groups, common criminals and the political offenders. Then each group was transferred to different parts of the island. Common, common criminals were scourged, 
Political offenders were treated with a greater degree of respect than common criminals on Patmos and were allowed to freely roam the barren land. Now that might sound like something good, uh, but it wasn't, okay? <laughs> okay, um, let me hold on one minute. Okay, the scourging was designated to serve as a warning that <laughs> poor behavior would be dealt with swiftly and harshly. Criminals incarcerated on Patmos worked under the constant gaze of the Roman soldiers who watched their every movement and punished them ferociously for the least offense. Some early Christian writers recorded that prisoners on Patmos worked in mine quarries. However, archeologists have found no evidence on the island to support these claims. Political offenders were treated with a greater degree of respect than common criminals on Patmos and were allowed to freely roam the barren uh, island. However, this type of prison sentence didn't fare well for political prisoners because they were not provided with any clothes, food, water, or medical service and were responsible for their own survival in the harsh conditions of the island. As a result, many died of starvation, disease, and a lack of clean water or exposure. Okay, this is a little virus on my computer. Okay, political offenders, political offenders sometimes form communities to create a better chance of survival in such a hostile environment. At the time the Apostle John arrived on Patmos in 95 AD, it's known that several communities already existed, uh, populated by people and even entire families who had been exiled to the island as political prisoners or the, Rome of the, or the Roman Empire. How did John, the sole survivor of the original 12 disciples by, by 95 AD, become an ex exiled prisoner on Patmos? <laughs> to find the answer, we will recall the remarkable accounts of John's life in the years leading up to his exile on this forsaken land. And so we're gonna look at some things uh, concerning John. John and Mary's uh, residency was in Ephesus. And uh, we're gonna look at John, if you can turn to John 19, 25 through 27. The role of the apostle John was uniquely different from the other apostles because Jesus had given John the responsibility to care for his mother, Mary. Pardon me? At the foot of the cross, right? At the foot of the cross, right. As John wrote, he vividly remembered when Jesus entrusted the care of Mary to him. In his own words, John related the moment in John 19, 25 through 27. He said, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Early Christian history confirms that John cared for Mary to the end of her life. When he and the other apostles left Jerusalem between 37 to 44 AD, John ministered in various parts of Asia Minor, probably settling in Ephesus with Mary, uh, Mary later, sometime around the year of 67 AD. There are quite a few his historical sources confirming that Mary, the mother of Jesus, moved to Ephesus with John. Perhaps the most significant 
evidence that attest to Mary's residency in this city are the ruins of the ancient church building located in Ephesus that was named in Mary's memory. The first church building in the entire world to be named in her honor. Since churches were built in honor of local saints at that time, it is reasonable to conclude that Mary was once a local resident and that the church was therefore named in her honor. And what they did uh, in the East, and when they found a site that was significant through biblical um, prophecy or anything like that, when they found a site what they would do is they would build a church on that site to memorialize it, okay? And so that's what they did here. This is, uh, it is said to be the last residency of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And this is a place now that can be visited. And it is believed that once her house once stood there, but they built a church building over it. And they did that often. They did that all the time to mark the places. Okay. Uh, the house of the, of the Virgin located in a natural park between Ephesus and Siljuk is believed to be the last residence of the Virgin Mary, mother of Jesus. The peaceful site is sacred to both Christians and Muslims and is visited by many tourists and pilgrims. Okay. I just wanted to show you that. I thought that was interesting. John's Exile. The book of Revelation explicitly states that it was written while John was on the Isle of Patmos. This is the only book in the New Testament where the place of writing is given. According to a tradition preserved by Arrhenius and Eus, uh, Eus, Eusebius, thank you. I was saying it all, I was saying it right all day. And I get up here, I knew that was going to happen. And Jerome, John was exiled in AD 95 during the reign of Emperor Dominion. Dominion. Mm -mm. Dominion. Uh, Dominion. Let me see. Okay. Okay. The Midian. Okay. He was the emperor. His exile ended upon the ex, uh, the accession of Nerva in in 96 A.D. Okay. Revelations 1 9, a vision of the Son of Man. And John says, I, John. Both your brother and companion of the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the isle, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to, let's see, okay, okay. Uh, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardius, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Okay. A picture of the island of Patmos, you can see it better. Um, and they say that um, it was virtually impossible to escape from the island, because what would happen is it was a very jagged island and what would happen if they went off the side of it, uh, the, the, the water would, uh, would beat them up against that island and it would kill them, you know? That's the way the current would go. And so it was virtually impossible to try to escape. You, you, you were going to lose your life uh, unless God did a miracle on your behalf, you know? 
there is a miracle reported. Uh, there, they said that as John was on that island, uh, that um, I mean, he did what John do. He uh, discipled people, and uh, you know, they said uh, many miracles happened. But I will share, if I have time, a very noted miracle that has been recorded in history that happened uh, to save John's life. And, uh, but anyway, so John survived. The emperor behind John's arrest in Ephesus. After the Apostle Paul was, be, after the Apostle Paul was beheaded in Rome in the year 67 AD, the Apostle John's leadership role in Asia Minor became significantly more visible to the local churches of that region. For approximately 27 more years, John guided the churches from his hilltop home, but, but near the age of 90. John experienced the unexpected. He was arrested, shackled, transferred to Rome to stand trial before the emperor Domitian, Domitian as a political offender. Early church leaders such as Irenaeus and Eube say that word again? Eusebius, Jerome and others wrote that John was banished from Ephesus and exiled to the Isle of Patmos during the Emperor <coughs> Dominion's 14th year of rule. This would place John's arrival on Patmos in the year of 95 AD. However, the actual date of his arrest was sometime earlier, possibly as early as the year 93 AD. Okay. Uh, let's see. Domitian, the tyrant ruler. Domitian was a tyrant ruler. He was, he was born in 51 AD, the son of Emperor Vas, uh, uh, Vespasian and the younger brother of Titus, who ruled the Roman Empire for two short years after the death of his father Vas, uh, Vas, Vespasian. I don't know why I can't say it now, I've been saying it all day. Vespasian. In 81 AD, Titus became strangely ill. As he lay dying, his younger and jealous brother Dominion demanded that the Praetorium Guard hastily name him the new emperor. Dominion was quickly given the title Augustus and upon Titus' death, he became the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Speculation persists that Dominion played a role in the strange sickness that abruptly claimed his brother's life and ended Titus' short two-year reign of the Roman Empire. At first, Dominion appeared to be benevolent and people had high hopes that he would be a kind ruler. He demonstrated skills that, that proved he could, be, he could be an able manager. He exhibited an understanding of economics and he was deeply immersed in pagan idolatry. All qualities that pleased the Roman population. The hmm. Midian also proved to be a fabulous builder. In fact, some of the most marvelous and massive architectural structures even constructed in the Roman Empire, ever constructed in the Roman Empire, were completed during his rule. Initially, uh, Domitian seemed to display the leadership ability Rome needed and appeared genu genuinely caring for the welfare of the empire. But as time passed, this emperor began to show his true nature, emerging as one of the most wicked and merciless tyrant in human history. Convinced it was his sole responsibility to set the proper moral code for the empire, Domitian 
declared himself censor perpetuus. Censor, censor perpetuus. A Latin phrase meaning perpetual censor. This gave him the legal right to reset the moral code of Rome according to what he believed was morally right and wrong. It also gave him the right to censor or eliminate any part of the society he deemed offensive or unnecessary, and any person or group who stood in opposition to his ideals. The emperor's self-appointed role of censor perpetuus was not well accepted by the upper echelon of Roman society. They viewed the emperor's establishment of a new moral code as grossly hypocritical. Since rumors abounded regarding his own acts of incest and homosexuality related uh, relates his homosexual relations with young boys. Once the censor perpetuous, perpetuous had been granted, the Emperor Dominion possessed a powerful new weapon that he could use to censor, silence, eliminate, or purge any public or private person who spoke despairingly of him or who opposed his commands. He quickly began to take advantage of this new tool to secretly arrest and imprison those who he disliked or distrusted. What began, what began in secret soon became public as, as scores of people began to be arrested, shackled, imprisoned, forced to fight gladiators and beasts in the arenas or slain with the sword. Torturous acts carried out during this time was horrific. One writer tells uh, that Dominion's men delighted, and this is really gross, you guys, in inserting fire through the victim's private part to elicit false confessions and to entertain and to be entertained by others' pain. By the year 93 AD, Dominion's madness has reached an all-time high. It was about this time that he declared himself Dominius et Duess, a Latin phrase meaning Lord and God. Other emperors had been deified after death, but Dominion wanted more. He wanted to receive worship as a god while he lived. When Dominion made his declaration of godhood, temples began to be constructed in honor and a new, and a new order of priesthood was created. People bowed to his image, burning incense at temple altars to acknowledge his divinity. Those who refused to comply were censored. That is, they were arrested, imprisoned, exiled, or killed. Here we can see the stage set for John's exile. Okay? The, tragic, uh, the tragedy Dominion created for so many caused even his close confidence to realize that he was a monster who needed to be eliminated. Dominion was assassinated in his chambers. But before we... Okay. All right, I thought I had a picture of him. I did. I don't know where it's at, but somewhere. Okay, Dominion's 15 year rule was marked with such hor horrendous atrocities that upon his death, the Senate issued a damnatio momotia. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but Minister Marty said, just act like you know what you're saying. <laughs> okay. An official edit that demanded that that damned the evil emperor's rule and called for eradication of his memory, including the de uh, demolition of temples, 
buildings and statues that had become constructed in his honor. So he was such a bad emperor, such a bad ruler, that even uh, Rome, who were into pagan worship and they were known for cruelty when it came to punishing people for doing wrong, they wanted to get rid of even the memory of him. Okay, So they was like, let's act as if this man never existed. You know, Let's wipe out all memories. Let's tear down all of the, the stuff that he has built. Let's do the, uh, let's, let's, let's just get rid of, of this. I mean, it took them, I guess, to an all-time low. But a mere, a miraculous deliverance from boiling oil. Who have ever heard that John, um, the Apostle John was put in boiling oil? Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, over and over again in the history, uh, this has been documented that this thing actually happened. And people that wrote about it uh, were historians and people of that day wrote about uh, this thing. But I just want to tell you, a few years prior to Dominion's assassin assassination, the elderly John was dispatched to Rome, where he stood trial before the cruel Roman emperor. Domitian ordered the apostles to burn pagan incense to save his own life, but John refused. The early Christian apologist Tertullian uh, gives an amazing account of what happened when John refused to bow to emperor to emperor pressure. Domitian became furious and ordered John to be thrown into a vat of boiling oil. Observers waited for John to die in the boiling oil, but instead they watched as John then got out of the vat unharmed. Unharmed. How is that for being in the will of God and protected? Amen. Protected, you know, in a natural circumstance, a pot of boiling oil. And think about the character of this man that was doing it, you know. Uh, boiled this big pot of oil and had John thrown in it. And they're waiting for John to die. In any normal situation, he would have just disintegrated, you know, just burnt to bones. And, uh, but then he crawls out of this boiling pot. And they said, uh, the Midian got so uh, scared and afraid that that's why he banished John. It was like, get this man, instead of him repenting and saying he must know God, you know, or say, he could, he could even say, are you a God? And then John could have said, no, but I serve the true and living God, you know? And the man could have gotten saved. But he was so wicked, you know, that he was and scared of the circumstance and situation. But instead of repenting and seeing, man, don't you see you have come in contact with a power greater than yourself? You know, but instead of realizing that, he just went on to do some, some more wickedness. So that was his whole motive of banishing John, okay? Of banishing John. Domitian was furious and ordered John to be thrown into the vat of boiling water. Observers waited for John to die in the boiling oil, but instead they watched as John got out of the vat unharmed. And when the emperor saw John emerge from the boiling oil, unscathed, he was terrified. Tertullian, who was known for his accuracy, recorded John's survival from boiling oil as a historical fact. Other early Christian writers also recorded this supernatural event. The Midian then gave the order for John to be forever taken away from his presence and exiled to, the, to Patmos to suffer the fate of hardened criminals. 
And John found himself on a ship filled with criminals, sailing to the worst island prison in the entire known world at the time. And when the ship first docked at the port of Patmos, common criminals were then entrusted into the hands of guards while John and the other political prisoners were abandoned with no direction, no help, and no guidance, left to roam an unfamiliar island that was nearly devoid of food and fresh water. It was up to each individual political prisoner to find a way to survive in this hostile environment. But think about this. How many know that John's faith was on 10? Way up there. Now, if God can get you out of a pot of boiling oil and you come out unscathed, you ain't got to worry about what you're going to eat and drink when you get on that island, right? And he survived for 18 months. And it said that uh, once uh, Domitian, the evil ruler, was assassinated, uh, that he he was let go. He was let go, and he came back to Ephesus. Uh, but let me pick up where, let's see. Okay, there's a sculpture of him that was the Midian. Okay. 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 Before we get there. All right. Uh, after the death of the Midian in 96 AD, amnesty was granted to those who had been wrongfully imprisoned during the evil emperor's rule. Arrhenius wrote that John returned to Ephesus after the death of Domitian. Most sources agree that elderly apostle lived until the elderly apostle lived until the year 100 AD. Also other sources stated that he may have lived until 104 AD. This would mean that John lived to be approximately 100 years old. He was the only one of the original 12 apostles to die a natural death. Even though he suffered at least one attempt on his life in 18 months of exile on the island of Patmos. Okay. And so I wanted us to get a look at the writer of this book, you know, and at the relationship of Jesus. You, if you remember Jesus as one of the apostles, um, John was referred to as the disciple that, that Jesus loved. Right, that Jesus loved. And, you know, as I was studying uh, for the book of uh, Revelations, I began to, to see again the special relationship that Jesus had with John. And even though Jesus had left in physical form, uh, he died, was buried, rose again, showed himself to the people, but then he, he, he left and left a work for his apostles and for the disciples, uh, you know, he appears again to John on the Isle of Patmos, you know. And uh, uh, John by himself, you know, uh, and uh, then he gets, you know, this uh, encounter with the Lord, you know. And, uh, but I think back on how Jesus <coughs> loved John. He loved all the disciples, we know that. But he had a special relationship with John. And I think uh, he, you know, he, you know, Jesus operated in all of the gifts as a man on planet Earth. And I think through the gift of, of prophecy or the, uh, the word of knowledge, he knew that John was going to hold out to the end. That John was going to be unmovable, you know, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And John never got off point. You know, he stayed on course, you know, and I believe that touched the heart of Jesus so, you know, that he loved that man because he could see how that man was going to live for him, you know. 
even after he left. This, these are just my thoughts. I can't prove that. But I just believe, you know, because he knew what Peter would do. He still loved Peter, but he knew what Peter would do when Peter was talking a big talk, like many of us do, you know, God, I'll do this for you, and God, I'm going to do that until we're confronted with opposition, and then we don't kind of feel as, you know, as confident or as brave and strong as we did when we were saying it. Uh, but uh, so it just, it touched my heart because I could see why Jesus felt the way he felt about John, you know. I could see why he felt the way he felt about John, looking at John's life. Um, okay. All right, we have a few minutes. Okay. Okay. The author of Revelation is John the Apostle, and most agree. Okay. Most agree. He actually says it four times that he is the writer of the book. He is the writer of the book, okay? Um, why don't we look at that? In Revelations 1.1, 1, 1, he says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant things which must shortly take place. And then if you go to 4, it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And if you jump down to verse 9, it says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then chapter 22, verse 8, if you can just swing there. It says, Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Okay. So over and over again, John identifies himself as the writer of the book. A picture of John the Revelator. Okay, don't know if it's a true picture of him, but it looks kind of ancient to me, you know, <laughs> but anyway. So maybe he looked like this, okay? The author, it is believed that it's John also because the author uses several words that only John the Apostle uses in the Gospel of John and in the Epistle. Uh, he calls Jesus Christ the Logos, which means the Word. And he says it in Revelation, and he says it in John, and he says it in the Epistle, 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. He talks about Jesus being the Word. And that was unique to John the Apostle, calling Jesus the Word. Okay. Uh, this book is dated uh, 95 to 96 AD, because that is when it's believed that John was actually on the Isle of Pat uh, Patmos, and he talks about uh, re re receiving this on the Isle of Patmos. Okay. Some hold to an earlier date during Nero's reign around AD 68. <coughs> this date fits, um, but not this date, but uh, the 95 to 96 fits the circumstances surrounding John's life. I didn't write that quite right. John has been exiled to a rocky island in the Mediterranean, the Isle of Patmos. As far as is known, he was not exiled by the Emperor Nero. Nero was burning Christians in his day, not banishing them. Amen. Okay. Amen. The state of the church pictured in Revelation differs from the church pictured by Paul in the 60s and 70s AD. 
this uh, this definitely points towards the latter date. Okay. <coughs> The purpose, John had three purposes for writing Revelations. And it was written uh, to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, Philadelphia, Pergama, Pergamos, uh, Sardius, and Laodicea. The immediate purpose was to allow Jesus Christ to proclaim, behold, I come quickly, you know. And um, at the time of the writing, the church was, you know, a lot of time had passed since Jesus had come and died. And, and uh, so the church was kind of weary and different things. And, and Jesus wanted to encourage his church. You know, he wanted to encourage his church, the church that existed at that time, and he wanted to encourage the, the church, us, the church now. The second reason was the historical purpose is to allow Jesus Christ to proclaim to his followers mm -hmm. and to the world of every generation, behold, I come quickly. I come quickly. And he said it over and over again. In other words, don't lose sight of this. Don't get preoccupied with what's going on in this world, other things, and not remember that I said that I am going to come again and receive you unto myself. Amen. See, when we have that on the forefront of our minds, when we're constantly thinking along those lines, it makes us live different. You know, it makes us live different, you know, because when you are uh, mindful of the fact that uh, Jesus can come at any time, uh, you, you, you're going to live differently, right? You're going to be watching what you say, watching what you do and how you do, and you're going to be mindful of the things that he's spoken to you. The thing that uh, came to my mind as I was looking at uh, the assignment that God gave John, the Apostle John, you know, and when you think about the writing of all those things, you know, all of those symbolic things he had to write about and all of revelations he had to write, you know, and I often, you know, how many have ever felt an unction to do something for the Lord? But you let it slip or didn't get it done, or put it off, or said you're going to do it, you know. Thank God that John didn't do that. But he wrote, and he did that thing that God had called him to do. You know, but when we keep in our minds that, behold, I come quickly, I think we will be more apt to take seriously the unction you know, that God puts on us, gives us to do, the assignments, the things that he tells us to do, Amen. you know. Uh, Elam is in a time. Elam is in a, a time that God has us in. And right now, the Elam is saying, get the people disciple. The people need to be strong. Yes. Get the people strong. And things are mounting up, you know, uh, the uh, persecution. Things are, are really heading towards... A, a certain time, you know, uh, in history, you know, and as time persists, you know, uh, people uh, lose sight of God and things, you know, go around and then things get worse and worse and worse. But I do believe that we're in a time where we are witnessing persecution, we're hearing about it, but that we're going to even see it at our very door. And, and so God is saying, get the people strong. Get the people strong. Start Bible studies. You know, get, get people disciple. You know, closer knit where, where people are encouraged uh, to, to really walk this walk. You know, because uh, there is a lot of, you know, there are quite a few of us in church. But when we get out of church, you know, we live like the world lives. But the people of God should not be like that. We should be living like the world says live every day of our lives and everything we do. Yes. I was thinking about what you said when you talked about how 
Jesus was, how Jesus loved all of his disciples, uh, you know, and how John was kind of special and how uh, the fact that, that Jesus knew that John would stand and endure. And I was thinking about um, pastors of a church. When the people, when each person is at the, is at the point in their life where they're able to stand like John did, not up and down, not in and out when this thing happened to them, then they run away from church. And I was just thinking how when you are at that point where when whatever comes, you're able to stand, it's one less worry that pastors have. You know, I'm not saying it the way I want to, but I think you're, you know, getting, you're getting it across. Um, you're right. It's just that. one less worry. They can go on and, and do, you know, mm -hmm. I want to say more to really hit what I'm trying to hit, but, you know. Yeah, absolutely. The more mature believers you have, the more you can get accomplished. Okay. And also, the more help you have in a church, and you know, that, with... burden on the pastor, because Paul talked about, and the cares of the... Well. And Minister, uh, Minister Teresa's right, you know, the Lord is saying now that we need to get stronger in the Word, and that's why we're having Bible studies, and people leading Bible studies, because uh, it is a weight on a pastor when, when there are people in the church that are not growing. It's kind of like a, a shepherd guiding his sheep, but then a few sheep are always kind of off. And, and, and the pastor knows, the shepherd knows that there's a wolf, right? Just right, just right, right, right where they're standing. And, and the pastor, how, how can a good shepherd go to sleep knowing that there's some sheep standing right by the wolf? And it's the same way with a pastor. And Paul talked about and the concerns of the church. Those weights were on him, you know, because he's, he's concerned about their survival. He's concerned about their success. He's concerned about what would happen to them if something happened to him. Would they be lost? And, and that was Jesus' concern. And that's why he was always trying to develop his disciples and teach them lessons right before he got ready to go. Because one day he knew that they were going to be confronted themselves with the devil. And they would have to stand. They would either stand or fall. And so we're living in that time right now. We're yes. living in that time right now. Yes. Yes. That we need to stand and, and be a, a less of a burden, a weight to the pastor. Absolutely. You know, because our hearts, you know, um, we don't want to see anybody fall, anybody stumble, anybody get devoured by the enemy, anybody lose out. You know, and not uh, go to the end of the fulfillment of what God called them to. And I have lost sleep over it. Pastor has lost sleep over, you know, praying for the church and members in the church. You know, God, uh, of course, he will uh, give us an insight, an oversight, a foresight where we can see things, you know, see further and see things that, are coming and also see into the lives of our people. You know, we can we can see by the Spirit of God. I, I can't even explain it, except it's, it's an equipment that God gives. You have to have it to pastor effectively. Uh, but absolutely, you know, absolutely. Um, I'm going to give you the third one, and then we're going to have to um, stop. The third one, the third purpose was the godly purpose to give to the church and to the world the revelation of Jesus Christ, okay? Um, this was the purpose of revelation, okay? Uh, God wants us to have this, you know? He doesn't want us to be afraid to go into revelations. He wants us to go into it, I think, uh, cautiously with the right heart and uh, before him for understanding. Uh, but there's a blessing on us going into this book and reading it. So I want to encourage you. 
uh, to begin to read it for yourself and uh, get an easier translation if you have to, to read it uh, through. But uh, we're going to now um, uh, start getting into what's in the book of Revelation. I have a little bit more uh, historical history things to, to kind of give, but we're going to get right on into it. And so get into it with me. You guys study and, and let's get into this together and let's, let's hear what God uh, has to say to us. And I'm excited already about getting to the last chapter of Revelations and having that feeling that I felt once we got through Luke. You know, because, uh, you know, we all have our strengths and we all have our weaknesses. And I'll say this quickly. One of my weaknesses is impatience. You know, I like things, you know, I have a daughter that's just like me and she drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. I have learned, you know, <laughs> I have learned um, over the years to kind of let the Lord deal with my impatience. But... Uh, sometimes to go through slow is, is, is hard for me, you know, to go through like that is hard for me. I just, I, I don't know why I confess that to you all. Maybe I need you to pray for me about that. <laughs> but I felt such a good feeling, you know, going through the entire book and not saying, oh, they're bored with it. Oh, God, maybe I'll go into something else, but completing it because we need to complete it. And I'm excited about us going through the work like this because I believe we'll get stronger in the things of God. But stand up with me and let's close out. I'm gonna close out in prayer and um, ask God to, to really uh, move on us and calls us to be diligent where the word is concerned, more diligent than we are even now, to be even more diligent. But as we close out, um, anytime we meet like this, if you come with a need, don't leave out the same way you came. If you come with a need, let us know about your needs so that we, the body of believers here, can come into agreement with, with each other for God to meet that need. God designed that body. God designed the body of Christ like that, amen. Our gathering together like this, um, one of the reasons is that every joint would supply and that we would be able to meet each other's needs. So if you have a, a need for healing in your body, you have a need for um, baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have a need for prayer, something that you are struggling with, you need to get the victory in, you just need somebody uh, maybe a little stronger to come into agreement with you. We want to do that um, with you tonight. Um, whatever it is, you know, we want to come into agreement with you. Um, I want to make sure everybody here is safe. How many know that they know if you were to walk out those doors and something was to happen and you would die, that you know that you would find yourself in the presence of the Lord? that you would go to heaven. How many can say, I know that?